All right, uh, let's continue with lecture four. Um, so today we will continue the discussion of the moment of inertia and talk about torque. So moment of inertia, as we discussed last time, is the rotational analog of mass. And then torque is a rotational analog of force. So we start talking about torque and then try to um, connect these things better. So let's... Uh, Let's review uh, some of the, the, the things we talked about last time. So, so a review of of our last discussion. So, um, so we define the quantity known as the moment of inertia. So suppose you have some rigid body, there's some axis. So in general, it, in general, it can be a three-dimensional object, and the axis is somewhere in the three-dimensional space, goes, goes through it. Or you can also think about like looking, looking from here, or maybe your, your object is just two-dimensional, so it's something that's perpendicular to the axis. Again, looking here. So looking from above, what we see, we see the axis as a point, right? And there are some Maybe there's some two-dimensional object, or there's a cross-section of the three-dimensional object. So this object is rotating around that axis, right? It's, it's comprised of a, of a lot of different particles, so you can break it up into a lot of uh, infinitesimal pieces, and they're all rotating around this axis. Uh, so different points, because there are different distances from the axis, will have different velocities. So kind of the definition of kinetic energy based on one half mass velocity squared cannot be easily applied directly to this whole object because different parts of it have different velocities, right? The points that are on the axis are not moving. The points that are really far from the axis are moving fast. But we, we know how, how velocity is related to angular velocity, right? So every point is going around some circle whose center is, well, so the axis goes through the center of all of these circles for every point belonging to the object that's going around the circle. Um, so here, this is the projection of the axis. So if I focus on one point, I see it going around the circle whose center is that point, the pivot point, the axis, uh, and then we know that velocities go as r, this distance here, the radius of, of the corresponding circle times omega. So this allows us to uh, write the, the kinetic energy of, let's say, a little piece here of, of mass, um, mass dm. Its contribution to the kinetic energy we can write as one half dm, that tiny mass, times r squared omega squared, which is the velocity of that that small piece. So now, if I look at this quantity, if I basically multiply the mass of each piece by its radius squared, then all of these quantities multiply omega squared, which is the same thing for this entire rigid object, right? The velocities of different points are different, but all the points have the same angular velocity omega. So now if I sum all of these, so if I define i as the integral dm r squared, again, we break up the whole object into a bunch of small pieces. Each piece has mass m and is, if it's small enough, it can be at, at one distance r from the axis of rotation. So if we take that integral um, and define it as, as the moment of inertia, we can write the total kinetic energy as one half i omega squared. So it's a definition that allows us to replace mass by something else if we replace velocity by angular velocity. 
um, as we talked about in, in the discrete case, uh, we could write i as sum over i m i r i squared. Now, as we keep talking about other quantities in the context of rotation and rotational dynamics, we will be introducing analogs to other important um, dynamical quantities. So there's, there's an analog that we will talk about today called torque. And that's the analog of force for rotation that, that describes how effective a force is in causing rotations. Um, we had momentum when we were studying uh, linear motion. Now there's an analog called angular momentum, which we, we, we introduced. And it turns out this definition of the moment of inertia, I, is also very useful for finding analogs uh, for various equations um, that we had in the linear case in the context of, of rotational motion. So although so far we only motivated this definition by, by the kinetic energy, uh, we will see that it appears over and over again in different contexts. So it's a very uh, convenient analog for, for mass when we talk about rotation. All right, so th that was a brief review of what we did last time. We also practiced a little bit calculating the moment of inertia for some uh, simple problems, like we had a rod that we had to do a one-dimensional integral, or if you have a collection of point particles, which is a direct, um, direct application of this formula of, of the discrete sum. So today the plan is um, to first talk about a, a theorem known as parallel axis theorem, which allows us to relate the moments of inertia for one object around different axes. All right, so let me repeat that. So we, for one object, we, we managed to calculate the moment of inertia uh, for a given axis, right? All of those Ri's or these R's in the, in the continuous integral uh, were found with respect to, to a fixed axis that somehow is going through the object at some point, right? Um, and you can have various different axes, right? You can rotate the object around different points. So this uh, theorem uh, allows us allows us, at least for the case where the axes are parallel, um, to not repeat the calculation very often. So if we find, let's say, the moment of inertia around somewhere, uh, we can just use the theorem to find the moment of inertia around parallel axes that go through different points. So the statement of the theorem is, is this. It says, suppose you have this object, suppose there's some axis here, and there's another axis parallel that happens to go through the center of mass of this object. And then these are two parallel lines, so if you draw a line perpendicular to both, that's the distance d between the two lines. So d is distance between axes. Um, the theorem says that I around this axis is equal to total mass of the object times d squared, this distance, plus I around the, the axis that goes through the center of mass. All right, so that's, that's the statement of, of the theorem. Um, as, as shown here. So that figure may be a bit better, easier to visualize. Um, so first, I mean, let's think about this for a few minutes. Uh, so the first thing we notice is that Mass is never negative, right? Mass is 
positive, unless it's zero and there's nothing. And d squared, the real number squared, is also never negative. So it, it seems that the moment of inertia around any axis cannot be smaller than, than the moment of inertia around the parallel axis that goes through the center of mass, right? So that's, so ICN, if you just fix the direction and consider all axes parallel to that direction, uh, the axis that goes through the center of mass gives you ICM, and that's the minimum possible uh, moment of inertia that one can get. And then, of course, if we know the moment of inertia around the center of mass, uh, it becomes very easy to, to calculate the moment of inertia around, around any other axis parallel to, to that axis that goes through the center of mass. Right? We just add the total mass of this object times the distance squared between the two axes. All right. So let's try to get some intuition about this. So for example, last time we, we had this exercise where we calculated the moment of inertia of a rod around one end, right? So I around end point for a rod of mass m and length l. Uh, let's see what, what it was. We did it by doing an integral, and the answer we found was one third ml squared. So I was one third ml squared. Okay, so now if we're asked to find the moment of inertia around the center of mass, so what is I C N the moment of inertia around the center of mass, which is in the middle of this rod. Well, I mean we can do we can do an integral, right? Just uh, set our coordinate system somewhere else, do the integral. We can maybe use a trick, so saying that well, the moment of inertia the moment of inertia around the center, I can think of it as having uh, a rod of length L over 2 here, a rod of length L over 2 here. So then I'm going to get the moment of inertia of this rod plus this rod, and both of them are around an endpoint. So I can kind of use a trick and say, well, ICM is one third. Now each of these has, of course, mass M over 2 now. So if I apply that general formula to, to this half rod, I find m over 2 times l over 2 squared plus the same thing, right, for the other half. So that's, that's a trick to find this without doing an integral, just using the general expression we found. So that gives me... Uh, if I do two of these, I kill that factor of two, so I get one third m l over two squared. Two squared is four, so I should get one over twelve m l squared. Okay. So if I didn't think about this trick, I can use my general theorem uh, to find the moment of inertia around the center of mass, right? The, the, the assumption is that the axes are parallel. They're both coming out of the plane, right? So when we talk about rotation around the center of mass, we're thinking about this rotation like that, where the rod stays in the plane, just rotates in the plane. OK, so using the theorem, What can we do? Well, we have I around an endpoint. Let me just write it explicitly. 
is ICM plus the total mass times the distance between the endpoint and the center of mass. So that's the distance between these two axes, and that's L over 2 squared. Therefore, I around the center of mass becomes I endpoint minus M L squared over 4. And this was one third. That's the expression we found last time. So one third m l squared minus one fourth m l squared. So one third is four over twelve. One fourth is three over twelve. The difference is one over twelve. So it's a quite it's quite a powerful uh, theorem. And you know you can also like relate two different points. So if neither of the points are, are the center of mass, but you know where the center of mass is. So what, what we can do is, so let's consider an, another example. Let's say we, we know I endpoint to be this, one third ml squared. This is the center of mass. Let's say we want the moment of inertia around a different point. Here, that's the distance L over 4 from this endpoint. What is I around that? Well, both of them can be related, right, to the, to the moment of inertia around the center of mass. So if you have, if you know the moment of inertia around some axis, and you're interested in the moment of inertia around a different axis, parallel to this, neither of them are the, are the center of mass, we can again use the theorem. We, we relate both of them to the moment of inertia around the center of mass and then eliminate ICM. So let's go through this exercise here. So I can write again I endpoint is ICM plus total mass L over 2 squared. Right, the distance between the endpoint and the center of mass is L over 2. I can write I around this particular point to be I center of mass plus M. Now from here to here, I have L over 4. OK, so if I subtract these equations, I get rid of ICM. I never have to calculate it, so I can write I endpoint minus i is m l over 2 squared minus m l over 4 squared. OK? So I take i to the other side. i endpoint was 1 third m l squared. I bring this ml over 2 squared to this side, so that becomes minus L squared over 4. I bring this to the other side, it becomes plus ML squared over 16. And, you know, we can simplify this and find I around some other point. So it's a very powerful and, and useful uh, theorem. OK, so I want to spend a little bit bit of time, not too rigorously, but tell you about where the proof of comes from, what it looks like. But before that, let's do a quick, uh, quick multiple choice question. So we go over here. OK, so pause the video, read through this problem, and I'm trying to, to see which one is the correct answer. All right, uh, so, so we have two dumbbells. One has two masses of, two masses n. Um, separated by, by length r. We're interested in the moment of inertia about the midpoint of the rod. And in the second case, we have mass 
masses m over 2 separated by distance 2r. Okay, so how can we think about this, right? So the masses are going down by a factor of 2. The distances are going up by a factor of 2. But which one is more important, right? So if you go from A to B, just because you scale down all the masses by a factor of 2, you're going to get a factor of 1 half. But all the lengths uh, are scaled up by a factor of 2. And what appears in, in our equation is distance squared, right? So that gives us a factor of 4. So then without doing any calculation, we find that the moment of inertia for B must be twice that for A. Right? Distances are more important. Okay. So now uh, let's spend a few minutes thinking about how we can prove this uh, parallel axis theorem. So, uh, so first, let's, let's say this is an axis, and this is an axis going through the center of mass, and we have some object. So we can choose a coordinate system. In, in such a way that, let's say, the z-axis is around, along this parallel axis here. And so let's say if I look at it from the top, say I see the xy plane. This is the cm axis, this, this guy here, looking at it from the top. And then you can also rotate the xy plane such that this other axis that's parallel uh, falls on the x-axis. So let's say that's uh, the other axis. So again, looking at it from the top, it's in the z direction. It's parallel to this, so we're going to see a line. So let's say that's axis 2. All right, so then if you look at every point of this object, it doesn't matter what the z is, right? How much is coming out of the plane or going into the plane, or is it on this xy plane? What determines the distance from these axes um, is just the x and y coordinates. So let's say I have a point with coordinates x and y. And if that distance is r, I find r squared is x squared plus y squared, right? And if I look at this triangle here, here I have x, here I have y. That's r. So I can write write that. What about the distance to the other axis, let's call that r prime, right? So what can I say? Well, I know that from here to here, I have a distance d. So that's, so let's say, if you look here, so in this case, d is slightly larger than x. And this length over here, so I'm looking at, at this triangle. So from here to here, I have x. From here to here, I have d, the distance between the axes. So this length here is going to be d minus x. Or if x is on the other side, it's going to be x minus d. But it, it doesn't matter because you're going to square it. So we can write r prime squared is d minus x squared plus y squared, right? Because we put our 
are coordinating the system in such a way that uh, this this other axis crosses the the x-axis of our of our coordinate system, um, the y doesn't change. Now, now let's see what happens. So r is the distance from the center of mass, right? And r prime is the distance from this other parallel axis that's a distance d away from the axis that goes through the center of mass. Uh, I'm kind of using this language loosely when I say the distance from the center of mass. That's not strictly correct. It's really the, cor the correct language is, is the, the distance to the, to the axis that goes through the center of mass. So if you're dealing with a two-dimensional thing, they're the same. But if we're dealing with a three-dimensional object, it's not the distance between two points, right? It's the distance to the axis of, of rotation. So most of the time, of course, in this course, we deal with two-dimensional problems. And then we're just looking on the plane. Um, so in practice, like if the axis is coming out of the plane, these things are the same. But uh, this distance, in general, it's important to bear in mind that's not the distance to a point. It's a distance to an axis, to a line. All right, so let's keep going with this. So I can write I around the center of mass is an integral r squared dm. I can also write the moment of inertia around this other axis as an integral r prime squared dm. So this one becomes an integral x squared plus y squared dm. And the integral, of course, we're doing it where we have mass, right, over the volume of this object. This one becomes an integral d minus x squared um, plus y squared dm. Okay, so let me subtract these so I can write I minus ICM. So this minus that is going to be the Y squared terms cancel out. So it's going to be an integral D minus X squared minus X squared DM. What is this? That's d squared plus x squared minus 2dx. So now this becomes an integral d squared minus 2dx dm. The, the notation is rather <laughs> unfortunate, right? So we denote the differential by d, so this is like an infinitesimal mass of a piece, but we also call it the distance d. So this, this is d times x. Um, you know what? I'm going to just switch notation, right? Even though that's... Uh, that's the notation used by the book. Let's just call it capital D instead of D. So distance between um, axes. So I minus ICM, the quantity we're calculating, is integral d squared, <laughs> integral, let's say we called it capital D now, capital D squared minus 2d times x dm. All right. So the first term, d is a constant, it comes out of the integral, 
integral dm is the total mass, so that becomes d squared m. And this one is minus 2 integral, minus 2 d is again fa is factored out, x dm. But this, if you remember the definition of, of the center of mass, that's just the total mass times the x-coordinate of the center of mass. We picked our coordinate system in such a way that the origin is on the center of mass. So that's 0. And so this is 0. So this is just d squared. So we're done with the theorem, uh, with the proof of the theorem. Um, again, if this was a little bit too fast, kind of knowing the proof is not part of the course, we basically use the theorem. But it's not, um, yeah, it's, it's useful to see at least where it's coming from so it doesn't look too mysterious. OK, so now we, we get uh, some fun. Okay, so this is a problem. It's an example from the book. Um, so pause the video, read through the problem, and take a piece, piece of paper and a pen and try to, to, to solve this problem. I suggest um, doing it kind of not in terms of numbers. So let's say the length, instead of being 1 meter, assume it has length L, mass M. And those are the only two numbers. So let's try to do it in terms of a length and a mass. And, uh, and you can assume g again uh, as a parameter that enters here. And there's a hint. So the model uh, gives you a hint. It's a conservation of energy problem. All right. So, um, so let's go over the solution together. Um, so first, what are the words? So we have this rod, and it's hinged at one endpoint to the wall, right? Initially, it's kind of horizontally. We're holding it up, and then we let it go. It starts rotating around that hinge, just comes down under the influence of, of gravity. It's pulling it down, and eventually it comes down all the way and hits the wall. So it, it starts from the horizontal position, reaches the vertical position when it hits the wall. And the problem is asking about the, the speed at the tip of the rod when it hits the wall. So this point over here, what is the speed of that point? So this is a relatively complex problem, right? There are uh, several bits and pieces that you have to think through. To solve this problem. So let's go back to our, our notes. So example 12.4 from the textbook um, here. Example 12.4. All right, so this is our wall. This is the rod here hinge to the wall, length L, mass M. And then it rotates, it comes down, and eventually hits the wall. So we're interested in the velocity of that point, that the other end point when it hits the wall. All right, so this whole object is rotating around the hinge, right? So it's a rigid object. So it makes sense that it has one angular velocity of, at every point in time. Okay. So if at, at the last minute the angular velocity is omega, the rate of change of, of the angle, let's say theta, this angle theta, is, is omega, and omega can change with time, but when theta is 90 degrees, it's going to have some angular velocity, right? It's, it's changing with some rate. So let's say final angular velocity omega. 
So we can see that this point is again moving on, on a circle, right? And we know how to relate the, the, the velocities to, to angular velocity. We just need the, the radius, we just need the distance from this point to the hinge, to the pivot. And that length is elegant, right? The length doesn't change as the, the rod rotates all the way down. So we can write v is equal to L times omega. Okay. Now we need to find the final angular velocity. So initially, it's at rest. So there's no kinetic energy. Uh, so initial kinetic energy is is zero. Final kinetic energy is one half i omega squared. I is the moment of inertia of a rod around one endpoint, which we calculated before, I believe it was one third ml squared. Right, so it's rotating around an endpoint and the moment of inertia that matters is the moment of inertia around an axis that goes through the endpoint. All right, so we know that changing kinetic energy, let's say delta k, is the final minus initial. So the system has gained this much kinetic energy. 1 over 6 m l squared omega squared. Right? So we know the mass, we know the length l, we don't know omega. We want to find omega. If you find omega, we find the final velocity. Where is this kinetic energy coming from? It must come from the change in the potential energy. Okay, so how do we think about the change in the potential energy? Well, it's not a point, right? If you have a point particle coming down a distance h, its potential energy goes down by mgh. That's what we, we know from 161. If you have this extended object, well, this piece over here, very close to the hinge, is not coming down by much. As you get close to the hinge, your distance goes to zero. It's coming down by zero. This piece over here is coming down by a distance L, right? So we can divide it into a whole bunch of little pieces, see how much each piece comes down. And we see like, it changes like as, as a function of position along the, the rod, the distances linearly change as change from zero to L. So there's another useful uh, trick due to the definition of the center of mass because the center of mass is really like a weighted average of, of positions, right? So the position of the center of mass times the total mass is the sum of all little masses times their, their position. So we can treat this by noting how much the center of mass is coming down. That's a very useful, uh, useful application of the center of mass. So if the center of mass of an object moves down in the y direction by some this by some length h uh, regardless of of the shape of this rigid body its potential energy uh, comes down by the total mass times g times the distance so here the center of mass has come down a distance l over 2 Therefore, the change in potential energy is negative, right? It's come down, it's minus mg L over 2. Okay, energy is conserved, kinetic plus potential is conserved. So what we can say is 1 over 6 ml squared omega squared is mg L over 2. 
uh, we cancel out the m's we cancel out the two so we have one third l omega squared is g cancel out this l with one of the, the l's in l squared and from here we find that omega is square root 3g over l and we're done right so we, it was a direct application of of the conservation of energy but we have to there, there were a few things we had to be careful about. One is how much the potential energy ch is changing uh, because it's an extended object and different points move by different distances. It, it makes sense to, to think about how much the center of mass is moving during this whole process. And then all the kinetic energy is rotational. It's rotating around a fixed axis. So we know it has one angular velocity omega we know how it, it gives us a kinetic energy, but we need the moment, moment of inertia around the right point, around the axis that goes through the, the hinge, the axis of rotation. So then V becomes omega times L, and that's L times square root 3G over L. We take the L inside the square root, so that becomes square root of 3G L, right? When it goes inside, it becomes L squared and cancels out one the the L's. Okay. So in in the last uh, few minutes, I want to just briefly talk about the notion of torque, and we will continue the discussion of torque uh, next time. All right, uh, so, so the new topic is the, the concept of torque, which is, again, the rotational analog of force. So in this table that we had, let's say linear motion and rotational motion, so we talked about like position and angle, talked about velocity and angular velocity, acceleration and angular acceleration, and mass and moment of inertia. And then we can talk about force here, right? So we're used to forces uh, when we were talking about linear dynamics. And, and forces were, were what caused point particles to accelerate. So what is the analog of a force in the context of rotation is something known as torque and is shown by this uh, Greek letter tau. So how do we think about forces? So let's, uh, about torque. So let's try to consider a couple of examples from everyday life. Uh, so, Let's say we, we, we want to open a door, right? So first, have you noticed that the doorknob or the door handle is usually very far from the hinges? Suppose you're, you're trying to close the door or open it by, by pushing on the door, right? And so if you push on the doorknob or at the edge of the door, far away from the hinge, it's quite easy to, to move the door, to cause it to rotate. But if you go and push very close to the hinge, you know, you need a lot of force to make the door uh, move. So kind of the distance from the axis of rotation makes your force much more effective in causing rotation. And that's using a lot of tools, for example, like a screwdriver. So you're trying to make a screw rotate. Uh, so the handle of the screwdriver is, is uh, wider. So, um, so you're going to apply your force at a larger distance from the axis of rotation. So let's try to visualize this. Right, uh, so let's say this is 
screwdriver and there's a handle that's kind of wider here. So here, let's say that's, that's our screw. Um, so here the force, let's say the axis of rotation goes through the center of all of that. So if the screw is rotating, it's rotating around that axis. So now looking closely, I have a little tiny distance over here, right? Um, but then when you're grabbing the, the handle of the screwdriver, you have a larger distance um, from the axis of rotation. So having this distance that's larger allows a smaller force to be effective. In, in turning the screw. Many, many other tools like a wrench is a more extreme example, right, that, that works like this. So suppose, you apply your force here, again from the axis of rotation over here, you have a large distance and that that allows you to rotate uh, the screw. Opening a door is another example. A lever, we, we, we've all seen this, like if you want to lift maybe some heavy object, right? So something like this. So let's say you want to lift a heavy stone. Um, if you exert force here, because that distance is long, that force is more effective in rotating the entire thing around this pivot point and lifting uh, the heavy object. So from the everyday experience, we know um, we know that it's not just the force that's effective in causing rotation. It's a combination of the force and the distance from the axis of rotation, right? Distance between where uh, the force is applied and the axis of rotation. Now, there's also something about the direction of the force, right? So going back to our wrench, if I want to like rotate and make that, that screw rotate, I, if I apply my force like this, well, it's, yeah, it's going to be very effective in causing rotation. So this is effective. If I apply my force like this, I'm just pushing, right? I'm not causing any rotation. So really what matters is the component of the force perpendicular to the, to the rotation arm, let's say, the line from, from the axis to the point where I'm exerting that force. All right. Uh, so let's look at a couple of slides. Well, I think given that, let's let's try to think about this question for a little bit. So pause the video, take a few minutes or a few seconds maybe, uh, and and try to come up with, with the correct answer. All right, so it's, um, it's a door. There's a hinge. You're looking at the door from the top, right? And the question is, which force would be most effective in opening the door? All right, so F2 is not going to do anything. It's just pushing the door toward the hinge. It's, it won't cause rotation around the hinge. Uh, between F1 and F4, well, they're, they're forces with the same magnitude perpendicular to the rotation arm, right? Perpendicular to this line from the hinge to where the the force is applied, but F4 is much closer to the hinge. It has a shorter arm, so it's going to be less effective. F1 is more effective than, than F4. F1 and F3, again, they have the same magnitude. They're applied at the same point. They have the same arm, but F3 has a component in the direction of the, the arm and has a component perpendicular to the arm. So the component that's in the direction of the arm is in the direction, let's say, of F2, with in the opposite direction than F2, again, is just pulling the door away from the hinge. It's not uh, going to do anything regarding rotation. 
So the component of F3 that's perpendicular to the rotation arm is smaller than F1, so then we end up with F1 being the most effective, right? Now, so, so we, we have some qualitative intuition about what matters uh, in, in causing rotation. Um, again, another example here shown in this picture is a bicycle, right? So your foot exerts a torque that rotates the crank, and then this distance from here to here, uh, that makes the force more effective. Now, now we can come up with a mathematical expression that puts together these things. So one thing we can do is we can imagine, well, that there's an arm of rotation, right, measured from the pivot point to where the force is exerted. And then we can take the component of the force perpendicular to the arm and multiply that by the arm, define that as torque or tau. So in the, in the next lecture, uh, I'll come back to, to this definition and we try to both kind of do cal calculations with it, build more intuition, uh, think more about torque. So uh, in this lecture, so what we did, uh, we reviewed um, the moment of inertia, the definition of the moment of inertia, it's the motivation for, for defining it. We talked about the parallel axis theorem, which allows us to relate the moment of inertia around any axis to so the moment of inertia around the parallel axis that goes through the center of mass. Uh, we did a few examples working or, or using the, the parallel axis theorem. There was a proof, again, that's kind of not essential. You can skip over that. And there was an example of putting some of the things we've learned so far together, solving a problem using energy conservation and, and uh, other concepts in, in rotational motion. And we briefly introduced torque, which is the analog of force, which is what makes a force effective in, uh, in causing rotation. All right, so, so that's a good place to, to stop.